Well, um, hello. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation. I'm very happy to be here presenting my work. Um, I have to tell you that I divided my presentation into chapters. The timeline between the chapters is not linear, so please bear with me. Hopefully, at the end, you're going to be able to uh, join the dots and have a full picture of the narrative I want to present today. The first chapter is uh, Formé. Formé is um, French for formed in English. This is the project I'm going to be speaking about today. Formé is actually a series of uh, four art installations. Every, every time it was presented, it took a different name. Uh, formed with a different prefix. So in 2013, it was presented as uh, Deforme or Deform. In 2014, it was presented twice under the names Transformed and Paraformed. And in 2015, it was presented under the name uh, Forme, which is a fusion of two words in um, French, uh, which will translate into English as False Formed. I'm gonna I'm going to show you some documentation of the first iteration of this project, Deforme. And this is a video of um, the installation taken as if a visitor came into the gallery. So when you step into the gallery, you are confronted with a series of metal structures going floor to ceiling. These uh, structures are the support for uh, several portraits. Here the scale is important, that one in the middle. That's, that's me, that's my back, and I'm around six foot three, or around one meter, 88 centimeters. So uh, people can navigate the gallery, they can go around the installation, they can go into the space enclosed by the installation. Visitors tend to look upwards when they're in front of the uh, portraits, and these are the portraits. As you can see, they seem pixelated, and this is because they are actually photo mosaics. Every portrait is built with 4,800 individual photos, each uh, photo measuring three quarters of an inch by half an inch. They are organized in 120 columns by 40 uh, rows to make a portrait. Uh, this is one of the pictures being held by me. If you look closely in the middle of the picture uh, uh, I'm holding, you will spot a metal head which is from a pin that pierces the photo and it is used to hold the photo in its place within the mosaic composition. Uh, this slide shows the opening of the show in 2013. You can see the people that assisted and I'm allowed to make my opening speech. But you can see as well uh, one of the metal structures, floor to ceiling, that is used to, um, for, for the portraits. Uh, but this one doesn't have any pictures in it. You can see that the structure is composed of two metal bars and in between there's four plexiglass panels with uh, what seems to be some white uh, dots. The white dots are actually uh, holes that are uh, made in the plexiglass by laser. Uh, that's where the metal pins of every one of the 4,800 photos of the mosaic will be placed in. Here you have a video of the production drawings of, um, for the plexiglass panels. When we zoom in, we can see uh, the holes in red and we can see as well um, numbers that correspond to a coordinate system in order to know where to place every photo. The way these portraits are built is by hand. This is a video of a friend of mine, Marie-Michelle. She's uh, recorded here building one of the rows of one of the portraits. The row is made of 40 pictures. They have to be pre-cut, laid on a foam board, pierced with pins, and then put into their respective place in one of the plexiglass panels. For this installation, I had a lot of help. I'm very, very grateful um, to, to them for the time they invested into this project. And as you can see, every portrait is made of four plexiglass panels, which facilitates production and transportation. Once installed, this artwork uh, had seven portraits and hundreds, if not thousands, of hours of work. Uh, there is a last element that completes this project, and it is a robotic machine. This machine is actually seen in this picture. It is a frame. It has the same size as the portraits, a little bit bigger, and it is installed behind one of the portraits, the first one on the left. You can actually see the wires. 
here's a 3D uh, model of the machine. You can see that it is a frame. And what it is important to understand here is, is that this machine has one moving part that is called the machine's head, which is actually in the middle in yellow. Uh, the head can move anywhere inside the frame. And this kind of machine is what is called a vertical platter. Here is a video of um, my machine. And we can see the head moving from left to right. If we take the camera and we put ourselves in the profile from the side, we can see the head moving. But we can actually see that it, it makes a fast movement to the front of the machine. So as I said, this machine is installed behind one of the portraits. Here you can see a test being done with uh, one of the portraits structure. But in the opening day, I turn on the machine. Here you will see what it does to the portrait. This is an accelerated video. When the camera changes, please look to the upper right part of the screen. That's where the action happens. So the machine will start pushing the pins and dust the photos out of their place in the plexiglass. And little by little, one photo at a time from the top to the bottom, the portraits will be deconstructed. All the, all the pushed photos will be dispersed to the floor. And little by little, the installation evolves. It modifies the space it encloses, and thus it offers a different aesthetical experience to every visitor. Here's a time lapse of uh, the whole installation. It ran for uh, three weeks, and here it is the whole three weeks in just one minute and 30 seconds. Keep in mind that every time the machine um, pushes a photo, there's a clicking sound. So imagine during three weeks, a click, constant click, resonating inside the gallery that deconstructs every portrait. Let's go to chapter number two, Paolo Del Mario. So I'm a Colombian artist. I'm established in Saguenay. This is Quebec's province in Canada. That's why almost all my content is in French. I've been living here since 2011. My artworks are mostly time-based installations that exploit digital technologies. I develop my own software, my own electronics and robotics. And with my work, I explore the relationships existing between the individual and the space he or she occupies. And there is a structure around identity, spatial temporal and sociopolitical emotions. So let's see, this is Colombia. You can see in red the department of Caquetá, which is the equivalent of a province in Canada or a state in the US. Florencia is the capital of Caquetá, and I was born there in 1988. This is Florencia, a beautiful city, where I spent some of my childhood years. That's me on the left. We can actually see the artist vibe a little bit. And this is my family. Uh, that's me on the left, my father in the, in the middle, my brother, my sister, and uh, I think it was my mother who took the picture. There are two things you have to, to know about this context, the Kakita department. First, is that since I have a memory, my father was a politician. He was in the Chamber of Representatives for the Department of Kakita. He was a congressman. And second, is that my region is one of the spots where the revolutionary armed forces of Colombia FARC began in the 1940s and 1950s. This is, or was, I don't know, a Marxist guerrilla group seeking to uh, take power through uh, armed rebellion. So this meant that my father and the FARC were in the opposite sides of a 50 year long conflict. Uh, so I grew up in a context of fear, a reality of bodyguards, armored cars, and the priority of 
keeping ourselves safe. So in 94, I was six, we moved to Bogota, Colombia's capital. This is what's safer for the family there. This is Bogota. And we moved into this house, uh, this white house. Uh, while we were living in Bogota, my father kept doing his job and he traveled back and forth between Florencia and Bogota. And in the end of uh, the 1990s, FARC rebels became increasingly hostile against us. And in 2001, they attacked my father while he was sleeping in our house in Florencia. This was a surprise attack in the middle of the night. Official military reports state that at least 50 men attacked the house with machine guns, grenades, and bazookas. The attack was so brutal that the army had to push the rebels out of the zone with uh, tanks. A journalist went to the zone after the attack was finished and recorded the results of the attack revealed by the Day of the Life. Uh, three members of my family were inside the house, my father, a aunt, and a cousin. The three of them managed to hide at the beginning of the attack and survive the attack with only a few scratches. After the attack, my family was dismantled for a couple of years. I went into exile in Spain with my mother and my brother. My sister was in the middle of her law studies, so she stayed in Bogota with my father, who kept doing his work. They sought safety in apartments of several story buildings in order to avoid a similar attack. I came back to Colombia in 2004, I was 15, and I started my, back, my bachelor's studies in design and architecture. This is a picture of the university where I did my studies. At the end of my design degree, I was invited to go to UCAC, UCAC is uh, Université du Québec à Chicoutimi, University of Quebec in Chicoutimi. And this is Chicoutimi in the region of Saguenay. The invitation I received comprised to pursue a scholar, uh, a master um, in arts degree here, and to do research for the art module. That's how I ended up in, in Canada. Chapter number three, the meaning of Forme. So this is where everything comes together. So I told you to bear with me. Um, so after a year into my master's degree in Canada, I received a call from my father. He was being sent to prison. And the charges were accusations of conspiracy and rebellion as a FARC associate. This made no sense to me. After a life of surviving assassination attempts from FARC, my father is imprisoned, accused of being a FARC associate. It made no sense at all. So I decided to focus my master's degrees into this issue. First, I did a, a lot of research. I went into all those places I called home that I showed to you in chapter two, and I gathered information. I gathered everything related to my father's case, and I documented as well every square meter of the houses I lived during my life in photos. So I managed to do that in the house that was attacked, in the houses I, I lived in Bogota, the apartment in Bogota. And I managed to do the same thing inside the prison where my father was held. I managed to smuggle a camera. Don't ask me how. But I took pictures of his cell. And after my research, what I discovered astonished me. The witnesses against my, my father were all fake. We knew this. But there was one uh, witness that turned to the right side. He recorded a meeting with a justice official who was offering him money and exiled privileges in exchange of, of a false accusation against my father. Even with all the proof we had, my father stayed in prison. So uh, my conclusion is that the justice system itself wanted to have my father in prison. So in other words, my father was a political prisoner. Uh, the project you saw, For Me, De For Me, is simplified as, as, as uh, an overlapping of two elements. You have uh, the representatives of a corrupt justice system. Here you have the magistrates of the Supreme Court of Colombia. And this element overlaps with the violence, this corruption 
enables. So in four May, you see the portraits of the magistrates of the Supreme Court that signed the arrest order uh, for my father. And they are limiting an area that is the same as the cell in the prison where my father was held, 12 square meters. The photos that compose the portraits come from the houses I lived with my family throughout our history, the one that was attacking Florencia, uh, where we lived in Bogota, and as well photos from, from my father's prison cell. The machine that removes the photos reproduces poetically the violence we were subjected to. It is a precision device that one round at a time deconstructs and creates chaos. Chapter number four, the end of For Me. So in the process of the For Me projects for installation, I was threatened, my life was threatened, and I asked for protection to the Canadian government. They de 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 validated the persecution my family uh, was subjected to, both from the rebels and the Colombia Supreme Court. Uh, since 2015, I have refugee status in Canada. And my art allowed us to find support from Canadian ONGs who defended my father. And he was freed in 2016. Beyond for me, so after my father was released, I closed the Forbes series. And I started to build upon the device I developed. And that's how the Marmalade project came to existence. Uh, it is uh, very similar to what for me uh, was. And here, uh, the portraits of the magistrates that signed the arrest, arrest order against my father are deconstructed as well. But they are, um, the, the mosaics are, are made of uh, marmalade uh, brands, Colombian marmalade brands. Uh, you have to know that in Colombia, marmalade, uh, it is a metaphor to speak about the uh, uh, spread of power in a corruption manner. So, in this new installation, I set up a table with Colombian marmalade and some bread, and people could come and make a marmalade um, bread uh, and, and eat like a, a portion of the of, of Colombian power that come back, comes back to the people. There's another project. This one is called Entropy. Entropy. Uh, entropy, for entropy, I, I use the same device that evolves. You can actually see that it get, gets a little bit more sophisticated. And for entropy, I detach myself for, from the political matters of my research. Uh, in this project, I track the faces of the visitors live and I project it into, into the surfaces and the machines uh, deconstruct them. Here, I, I, I explore the notions of identity digital identity and how they are all subject to universal entropy. In the last chapter, I have a lot of other projects I would love to share, but those are the ones I chose for today. The last chapter is that I have, um, uh, I'm very proactive in the cultural milieu. I did an acquisition of a house that is intended to, be, to become an uh, artist residency here in Shikurimi. And I'm finalizing the acquisition of a gallery and studio space here as well in order to show the works of artists. I am planning to create residency exchanges. Everything is in pause because of COVID. That's my <laughs> presentation for today. Thank you for watching and uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Paolo. Uh, well, you know, something that really struck me about the, the work is the way in which uh, your work and your personal life, uh, your personal tragedy uh, related to your father, to your family, your convoluted uh, life in Colombia and in exile, you know how it uh, 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 really, uh, uh, the work is like a, a, an X-ray picture of it. So it's not, it's, uh, not very frequent that we, witness an art uh, work in which it is so clear the way in which the artwork relates and illustrates uh, or analyzes you know, uh, uh, your, your own life, in a, uh, even 
I'm obsessing in a way. Also, uh, well, uh, your father was uh, finally, uh, uh, you know, put out of the prison uh, as a result, as far as I understood, of your efforts. Uh, uh, getting together uh, uh, evidence, you know, in order to uh, to make a case uh, for the father, and, and well, and you were successful. With that uh, what was that way. So, uh, so this also uh, is fascinating to me because the same material, the research material, uh, to to produce something. Uh, an art piece, you know, which is not uh, functional, <laughs> you know, in practical terms, uh, uh, was able uh, to work uh, practically in quite in a quite successful well, uh, way to the point that you you took your father out of uh, prison. So this, this connection is, is really very moving, uh, you know, and, and to see how your uh, artwork worked. <laughs> also, in, 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 in uh, um, how, do you, how do you say, in, in practical terms uh, and, and regarding a, a process, a, a, a law process in, in, in your country. And uh, so, uh, so this is something that uh, remarkable. Uh, also, uh, to me was interesting how you uh, activate uh, different areas uh, to create this uh, this uh, work, which is uh, very controlled. So here you have like a, like a, a photographic uh, representation of these uh, judges and you have the machine component you have the the digital uh, technology that you uh, activated and you have your research and you and, and of, of uh, hundreds of photographs that, that you used you know from the, the places that where you lived you know to to create uh, these images and uh, it's also uh, interesting to me that even though this uh, work, uh, I suppose, or I'm sure, is uh, quite an emotional for you, because you are dealing with this disgrace uh, uh, that your father suffered in your, your family and, and in your life, you know. But at the same time, the work is very clean. Is very clean and very uh, under control uh, because I, I I got the feeling that you as an artist uh, you work in a quite uh, analytical and, and, and net uh, way you know you want things to be organized and, and well put together uh, and so so this contrast also was uh, interesting to me. Because uh, you know, usually with a case like the one you personally suffered, you know, it's, it's something more like you know more emotional and and you know expressionistic or I don't know you know but this control uh, uh, is, is is very interesting. I I would perhaps uh, 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 perhaps tell you that that. Uh, I don't know, but uh, the use of the term uh, deconstruction to refer to the machine uh, working on the photographs, I don't know if it's quite adequate, because what the machines actually do is to destroy the bad guys. <laughs> you know, they are just <laughs> completely destroyed and, and thrown to the floor. You know? So I, I don't think it's a, it's a deconstruction. I think it's rather a, a well-deserved destruction. <laughs> what you do with these with these guys, uh, you know. So uh, uh, perhaps 
I, I, I would appreciate if you could uh, comment uh, on the way in which the, the relationship with, between these two spheres, uh, the, the jurat work and the, the legal process you went through to take your father out. Because the, the, the evidence, the material, the investigation that you used was the same for both. And uh, uh, so how, how, how was it? Uh, could you expand a little bit on that? Of course, thank you. Thank, thanks a lot for, for your observations. Um, yeah, this, this, this project became, became uh, personal, professional in so many levels. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of emotion. There's this, 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 this thing of trying to figure out what is going on with us. I, this, this was my reality since I was born. So understanding why, why there's bad guys and good guys and what side are we was part of the process. And before going into the legal part of, of, the, of the project, I had to make sure that my father was innocent. So I had to, to, to face uh, a research of, okay, am I, am I going to dedicate my, my art career or start it with a, a project when maybe my father has something to pay for? And if he has to, well, just let him pay for it and just correct his mistakes and I go back to society after that. But what I discovered was that I don't know how uh, all kind of illogical proofs were used against my father to keep him in prison. That's what I, I started to understand. There, there's something else going on here. This is just not some rebels trying to, to uh, get onto my father and hold to, to the power he had. There was an interest from higher spheres to, from the government to, to put him in prison. Um, and, and that's when I understood that my art could actually go and seek international help uh, in order to assure a, a, a just legal process for my father. I remember well, I had this, this conversation with an, a, a Canadian artist, an Acadian artist that told me, go look for help, you're here. What you need is international observation. They can, they can do whatever they want if they have Canadians looking at them. This is the Supreme Court of Colombia. They, they have to hold to their reputation. So uh, I ended up contacting um, several ONGs. There was one ONG in Montreal. I set up uh, all the research. I, I organized it, uh, all the proofs for the case of my father. They studied it. Uh, these ONGs have to study a case before accepting it. So um, there's one uh, ONG that was focused into defending um, falsely accused people in Mexico. They went through the case of my father and exceptionally they took it because I say exceptionally because they, they weren't, they, they didn't have any operations in Colombia yet. And after seeing all the proofs, well, they, they, they accepted to defend my father. They assisted to his trial in the Supreme Court. And you have to know that my father spent four years in preventive prison. Uh, so he, he trial, his trial didn't begin for, for four years. And what is uh, legalized in Colombia is, is only a six month uh, preventive prison. So there was a lot of uh, abuse from the justice system here. And whatever the result, we just wanted him to go free. You know, even with a, with a combination of two years, he could be free. You know? What mattered to us is, it was his freedom. And the cases, uh, the accusations he was in prison for were just a few of many. So until today, even if my father is, is free, uh, we keep battling uh, the justice system in Colombia because they are still uh, chasing him with, uh, with accusations. So we're still uh, holding on strong. Uh, and, and one question, uh, because I was thinking that for the audience who walk into the gallery and they see, well, those images and the, the destruction process, and, but I mean, that's not enough to really uh, grab 
the, the works content. Uh, how did you manage to give that uh, information to the public? Because I think that is, uh, I mean, the, 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 the installation on, on itself, visually, is not enough in order to really understand uh, the work. How, wh what uh, what did, did, did you use uh, gallery texts, wall texts, or, or how, how did, did you manage that? And that's an excellent question. Actually, I started uh, publishing the proof I found in online. That, that's when I, I, I received uh, threats. Uh, uh, people, someone wanted to, those, those documents to be um, taken out of my website. So what I did is was um, uh, use those documents and, and, and put them in the gallery as well. So there's, there's a wall, I didn't show it, I should show it actually. Uh, one of the walls, when you enter, there's four iPads. And the four iPads uh, hold uh, key documents that prove um, the magnitude of, of the fake, um, the false accusations that were, that were um, held against my father. Uh, one of the documents is actually uh, the audio recording of one of the witnesses that, that uh, recorded a justice procurer, uh, justice official, trying to, to buy him to, to make false accusations against my father. So that's the way I, 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 I presented that inside the gallery. However, I, I had like, I understood that this project had like two levels of two directions, parallel but, but different. I had the artwork, but uh, from my understanding, the artwork itself wasn't going to do everything. For me, it was the vehicle to, to send the message, to touch a sensible part of the audience, and then ask for help. And that's, that's what it ended up happening. I, I didn't want to completely overwhelm the, the, the aesthetics I wanted to, to, to provide with this controlled destruction happening in the gallery with all the legal uh, um, activist battle that we were having for, for the freedom of my father. So um, I, I saw it like two different terrains that actually just converged at, at some point. There were some people in the audience that didn't want to know anything about Colombia, that didn't understand it, that didn't want to know it, but have an amazing aesthetic experience when they come to the gallery. So I wanted to respect all, 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 all interpretation for, for the audience that, that came in and those who wanted to put their ear <laughs> and listen, well, I, I spoke to them and, and luckily enough, uh, some of them responded and, and acted and we had the, the positive result we had. Uh, well, you know, I curated an exhibition for the Bronze Museum of the Arts like a couple of years ago uh, under the title of Useless, Machines for Dreaming, Thinking and Seeing. And it's a way, uh, you, you know, I put together several artists for me all over the world, and uh, who uh, really dealt with the idea of the useless, uh, both in art, art as a useless activity, you know, uh, well, it was Kant, the first, who uh, phrased, uh, you know, this idea of the, the useless uh, in art, so that's not a practical function. And also, on, in general, you know, in philosophic terms and so, social terms eh? but now i was <laughs> thinking that uh, i mean uh, now inspired by by your work i would <laughs> rather curate a show about the useful <laughs> you know useful machines in in art and this this connection again you know between the, a, a, a very clean a, a neat uh, art installation in the white cube how it has these cables, these or, or these uh, 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 connections, you know, to a, a really a very practical and, and complex uh, process with the with the the target, the, the aim of taking your father out of prison, but even uh, you know more important than that, to prove uh, that he uh, he was innocent. Uh, so the, 
I, I think I, I, this uh, uh, afternoon, uh, well, I, it's my afternoon, it's your, your morning, has been very inspiring to me uh, in the first half with Omar and now with you, because you see how art is uh, uh, two different artistic uh, projects, but uh, that are very really involved uh, uh, with uh, uh, things that are uh, outside of, of the artwork. I mean, you are creating artworks, you are uh, exhibiting them in the art circuit, uh, but the, what you are uh, activating is the centrifugal character of art. You know, the possibility of art to successfully uh, deal with uh, a variety of situations, problems, discourses, uh, uh, things in general uh, that uh, are beyond uh, the, the art boundaries. And uh, I think that uh, uh, what attracts me the most about art is precisely this uh, centrifugal character and not this centripetal uh, character that has been so much uh, uh, stressed by many artistic practices uh, in the now, nowadays. Uh, so this is, uh, is, is really stimulating to see how do the, the two artists, uh, I had the opportunity, you know, uh, to, to exchange with uh, today, uh, you know, you are activating this uh, faculty that, that art also has. And uh, in your case, Paolo, I, I mean, you, I think that you are also um, very formal, you know, you, you like, like to have like a certain order and a certain aesthetics in your art, but these aesthetics are not like for decoration, but uh, uh, they are like a way to really uh, activate more, you know, to, to give more energy to what you want to, uh, to express or to convey uh, with your art. You know, now it's very interesting that even in the aesthetic uh, field, uh, some uh, thinkers, they are discussing about an aesthetic activism, which is something that you would uh, think, well, this is a paradox, this, this is a contradiction because aesthetics is also a, a different uh, territory. Uh, you know, and, and the activism, you relate it more to, you know, endurance performances, to, <laughs> you know, uh, community artwork, etc. You know, but I mean, the aesthetic is also, uh, there's an, an aesthetic activism because the aesthetic could be a, a weapon uh, to really, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, and, and really to enhance the uh, uh, the discussion of the problems that you want to to tackle, and uh, in, in your work in particular, I, I like very much, you know, this 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 little machine that is, you know, in a very uh, uh, slow and. <laughs> And, you know, very busy way, you know, is, uh, you know, step by step, little by little, destroying uh, these uh, figures. And, and it's, it's also very attractive, the fact that they are destroying uh, the faces of the judges, but at the same time, uh, actually, what they are doing, they are removing these photos of the, the, the homes that were destroyed. In, in the real life. So here there's a symbolic uh, component uh, which uh, really is uh, very, uh, it provokes, uh, you know, using uh, the, the mechanisms which are uh, more, uh, you know, traditionally ascribed, you know, to art. 
so that 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 was uh, really very interesting. But I have one question because I, I, I after you've been with so much uh, focus fully dedicated to to this work, which is not the, the, the work as uh, we, we know. It's, it's a whole process of investigation. It's, a, it's even a, perhaps a a psychoanalysis of of your own life, you know, is 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 something. Is is like this film Roma by Cuarón, the Mexican filmmaker, which it was actually like like a sort of self psychoanalysis of his uh, life when he was a kid in Mexico. You know, that so I think in a way perhaps this process was also something like that for, for you too. But then uh, one have the question after the, uh, now after this what after this dedication this focus then what you as an artist what's next? Yeah, thank you for for that question. Um, yeah, after after all that, what? Well, I can I can actually describe what happened. <laughs> Um, at first, you have to know that it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy at all to, to dig within all that happened and how it affected me. And I showed a picture of when I was about to make my, my opening speech. I, was, I wasn't able to, to verbalize, to, to, to speak the way I do it now. Um, it, 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 it was a process of, of making sense of the situation, of acting within the situation that it was a process of realizing that, that there was something troubling going on with me, with myself, with my family, with my country. And um, this project helped me to realize that and heal a lot, of, a lot of that nonsense that we went through and that left what, what now I think of like scars in our identities. And, and now it's easier. I really feel like it was a healing process. So, so yeah, it, it wasn't easy. After, after we released my my father, I, I had a one year burnout. I, I was completely exhausted. I wasn't able to work. I wasn't able to do anything. Um, after that, I started doing my other projects that you saw a little bit of, uh, Marmalade and Entropy. And I, what I, I, I want to do now is is take like a step back um, from what all these personal exercise that was so hard to do and and try to to level to take take the speech that i want to to do with my art that i want my art to serve as a vehicle of and um, to take it to to a more universal level and ask questions of why this kind of stuff happens is it human nature is it latin american nature is it something specific about my country or is it everywhere that this happens in different scales and that's why marmalade is more concentrated uh, into questioning corruption and how how we are, dr are driven by power and are have a tendency to just spread it and how do we do spread it is actually there's a tiny line of, on how do you spread power it, it becomes something good or it becomes corruption and the other project entropy it was a matter of uh projecting my self-identity I, I i build this this device that destroys portraits and i realized that it, it was almost a representation of myself like it was myself being destroyed by all this living nonsense and some nonsense that i went through in my childhood and I realized that there was a, a, a research, constant research of identity of myself. So I, I tried to use the same device I, 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 I had developed and, and try to ask the same question to, to people coming into the gallery. What is your identity? What, is the, what happens if you realize actually that we are just matter, that decomposes through time and when is the moment that you become someone else if all your matter is replaced or um, what does this mean the matter of identity when we are confronted to 
digital identity and uh, identity theft. And I'm, I'm kind of exploring those notions. I, I have been lucky enough to, to, to make those projects travel a little bit. And I don't know if I go back to, 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 to reach within myself to look to do something similar. And not because I don't want to do it, it's because I think I gave it all <laughs> that first project. I don't know what else to reach. And if you if you see the presentation I just did, I I I I, I showed you a house I, I I I acquired here, and it is my new home, my new reality, my new everything, and that's my new identity. So. So maybe the, the, the path now is to build to art uh, that is built upon what is my new reality now. You have to understand also that I, I'm in exile. I, I am a refugee, I can't go back to Colombia. So um, the, 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 the image of a cage is very strong within my work. For me that I showed, there were panels, the portraits made panels that made a room, but when everything is destroyed, that's the, Flexiglass are transparent. What it becomes it is a cage, um, and and for me, uh, Canada provide me protection, and I'm very grateful for that. But the fact that I can't leave, that I can't go back to my to my to my roots, the, the same protection, the same territory that that protected me, it has become my cage as well. So I I mean this 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 kind of understanding of what it, what it, what it means to me to, to, to be here now and, and how does it work uh, for an individual that had a life like, like I had. Yeah, I think it, my opinion that it would be, uh, I think, uh, interesting and, and fruitful for you, again, try to link your artwork with the your new or personal process of being an exile in, in Canada. And, and so the, the, the challenges, the contradictions, the difficulties, again, so I, I think that that, uh, I guess, uh, uh, will give you uh, like a very important material in order to continue doing this work at the one that you uh, showed to us uh, today you know, in which your own personal life, you, you search for, for the healing, personal healing process, you know, is, is so, 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 how to say, woven with your, your, your art work. And I think that, well, usually art is, is more, it's a territory to deal with difficulties more than to deal with the satisfactions. And uh, so perhaps that could be a, a, a way for you and, uh, and that uh, will uh, communicate beyond your own case. You know, this, uh, this, uh, very, uh, this contemporary problem of people of displaced, uh, you know, uh, out of the, uh, the, the, the countries or the regions or the places uh, with which they feel still identified. So these tensions, I think, uh, uh, involve uh, millions of people around the, the world. And, and so I think that this could be a very uh, fruitful terrain uh, for you to explore, uh, uh, departing from your own own uh, personal experience. So thank you very much. Thanks to you, Gerardo. That really amazing insights. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it.